So uh, again, welcome. And uh, while at one of the many meetings that I seem to attend at the meeting house, I noticed some of the Wallace Nutting photographs. And I asked somebody what they thought of the photographs by Wallace Nutting, and they gave me that blank look that made it clear they had no idea who Wallace Nutting was. And yet I knew that Wallace Nutting was a unique, really extraordinary character in American history and very influential. And the reason I know that is about 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to see our speaker, Tom Denenberg, speak on the topic of Wallace Nutting. He is the preeminent expert on the life and work of Wallace Nutting. And so I decided to give him a call and see if he'd be willing to come and share his knowledge about Wallace Nutting with, with us. And by the way, I should have had my prop here, but when I say preeminent, he wrote the book on this, uh, and I recommend it. It's very readable, and again, a fascinating story of a, a unique American. Uh, Tom is currently uh, the, I have to bend down and read all of this, but maybe I'll bring my computer up. He is the John uh, Wilmerding Director of the Shelburne Museum in Shelburne, Vermont. And this is a picture of their upcoming uh, light show, uh, holiday light show. Prior to moving to Vermont in 2011, he served as the Chief Curator and Deputy Director of the Portland Museum of Art, and he's uh, the Richard Koopman Curator of American Decorator Arts at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, and the Betsy Maine Babcock Curator of American Art at the Rinalda House. Tom received a BA in History from Bates College and earned his PhD in American Studies from Boston University. He has held fellowships at the Smithsonian and the Winterthur and taught at Boston University. Harvard University and Wake Forest. Tom is a frequent lecturer and has written extensively on the retrospective culture of New England, including books and thematic exhibition catalogs exploring the work of Wallace Nutting, Winslow Homer, Grandma Moses, and Andrew Wyatt. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Tom Denenberg and let's give him a warm Heritage Village welcome. Every time I hear myself being introduced, I'm reminded of the time many, many years ago where my wife was sitting in the audience and she said, you look really good on paper. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out um, this afternoon. Um, a little context for this um, project on Wallace Nutting. I, I, I set out to write a large book on the colonial revival, so the importance of his history and historicism and the colonial past in America and built landscape and culture and kind of why in the mid 20th century we got so interested in our colonial past. Um, and I wrote this big dissertation um, precy or kind of you know pitch to my professor and it was about seven chapters and at the end of every chapter Wallace Nutting showed up and ruined the story. Um, so, so I remember going to my professor and say well I think this guy is actually the story. Um, because he sort of showed up and he figured out, you know, how to how to commodify each sort of part of what I wanted to do. So I set out and wrote um, this this book on Wallace Nutting, which is what we'll we'll uh, kind of talk about for a little bit this afternoon. Um, and then we can have some Q and A, and I'll do my very best to answer questions um, after uh, afterwards. So, not not so long ago, wrote Wallace Nutting in 1921. It was impossible to purchase a natural, tasteful picture um, without going to great expense. Fine art was simply beyond the reach of most Americans. There were millions, he continued, who knew beauty when they saw it, but could not indulge in the work of old masters, or new masters for that matter. And this, of course, is our hero, Wallace Nutting, um, in a William Loring portrait from 1925, and this is at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. As for the more affordable media, the erstwhile minister pulled no punches. The watercolors of 20 years ago were numerous and, shall we say, startling. Um, domestic art, um, for all but the wealthy, consisted of one form of simulation or another. Um, Mass-produced statuary groups, like this John Rogers um, group, conversation pieces, plaster statue for the parlor, um, were very common. Um, chromolithographs and inexpensive stenciled landscapes adorned the walls of middle-class houses from the 1890s through the 1920s. 
Um, this is an Eastman Johnson chromolithograph. This is a little earlier. This is probably about 1865, right at the end of the Civil War, and it shows that kind of pastoral bucolic imagery that was so very popular. And a chrom chromolithography, of course, um, was a very uh, advanced form of graphic art in the 1840s, 50s, 60s. Um, and then by about 1900, it was uh, beer hall art. It was the, you know, it went from being, you know, middle class, respectable, something you have on the wall, to something that you would find in a saloon. So this is, this is a little bit of the background to what Mr. Nutting was complaining about. The diffusion of a modern artistic sensibility, however, profoundly altered our popular understandings of authenticity and the integrity of what, what really counts as art. Although chromos, as they were called, um, were promoted as democratic, um, educational, and uplifting, you should have something on your wall after all, you know, courier knives, something, critics grumbled that they were derivative. You know, it wasn't real art. As early as 1870, the nation um, weighed in on the issue. Quote, the chromolithographic imitation of an oil painting is a type of art that is most disgusting to the artist and to the cultivated eye. <laughs> So, you know, critics were taking a very, very, you know, firm stand on a chromolithography. By 1900, in popular understanding, for the work to be art, for something to be understood as, you know, singular, it required the touch of the artist. It actually required the singular touch of the artist. Um, and we can all kind of, in our mind's eye, close our eyes, and if you, if you came up with the, the sort of the turn of the century, you know, image in your head, you would have you know, probably a man wearing a beret, probably standing at an easel, painting something. So it's all about that single relationship. Um, etchings pass mustard, and print, club, print clubs flourished, but the simple demographics of a very rapidly expanding United States created novel and unprecedented tensions between the ideals, these new ideals of high art, and access to the real thing. So just as the population is exploding, people aren't gonna be able to afford that oil painting or that original sculpture. The question of appropriate subject matter proved to be equally complicated. And this is Edward Lampson Henry's painting, The Old Clock on the Stairs, again, right after the Civil War, about 1868. As daily life evolved into a series of encounters with institutions rather than individuals, nostalgia becomes endemic in the United States. The new middle class, mourning a perceived loss of social economy, that sort of face-to-face -face relationship, small town life, um, and caught in what historians have described as a feeling of weightlessness around the turn of the century, craved the stability accorded by history and tradition. So as the United States moves off the farm into the city, we have all of this imagery of uh, you know, farmers going about their business of, you know, mother and grandmother at the head of the stairs, um, spinning. So all of this kind of historicist imagery comes, uh, comes to the fore, really, let's say 1876 until about 1900. Um, they traveled to historic sites, Americans, middle class, traveled to historic sites, collecting antiques, which were once, that was once eccentric behavior, um, became a normative pastime. The new middle class desired an art at once authentic and available. Um, I'm very fond of the story. Um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet, listen children, you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere, was given um, an 18th century mansion house on Brattle Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Castle Craigie, it was called. It's now the Vassal Craigie Longfellow House. It's a park service house. Um, and when he um, began to sort of update the house in the 1820s and 30s, there wasn't even a category for antiques in the popular imagination, so a, a, a visiting British critic wrote a snide little uh, letter to a friend saying, Mr. Longfellow is collecting trumpery antiquities, so fake antiques in buying these sort of old American chairs to have in his house. So Longfellow, of course, um, was one of the premier um, providers of historical narratives by the 1850s and 60s, so he was one of the people, one of the guys, one of the creatives who basically made it okay to collect antiques by the 1870s and 80s. So he's one of these sort of fulcrum-like figures in American um, culture. So the, the answer to this tension between what could be popularly purchased for a few dollars, a chromolithograph, and then this new ideal of high art, proved to be a hybrid genre embedded in a cult of personality. 
Um, Hand-tinted photographs became the middle-class art. Wallace Nutting became America's new old master. Nutting's platinum prints, and several of you I know have them, um, the initial offering in what became a historically themed consumer empire came to hold a dominant place in American visual culture for close to three decades. Signed, matted, and framed, these sentimental views appealed to an audience seeking that traditional, historically suggestive aesthetic for the home. The softly-hued photographs offered consumers that middle-class art, a middling genre of art, more respectable than those chromolithographs, because those are now only fit for the, you know, the bar, um, yet far less expensive than the easel painting or even a watercolor. Photography made Wallace Nutting a household name before World War II. By the time the 1920s began to roar, the clergyman's fluid signature could be found coast to coast throughout countless middle-class homes, penciled on photographs or inked on photographs, branded, as you say, into reproduction furniture, as you see here, and printed on the title page of some 16 books and the cover of innumerable magazines like This House Beautiful, The Saturday Evening Post, um, and Antiques. Historically-minded consumers could keep track of the days on Wallace Nutting calendars, send season's greetings on Wallace Nutting Christmas cards, and even visit five restored museum houses operating under the Wallace Nutting banner in three New England states. You could go visit Wallace Nutting's world, if you will, his vision. The peripatetic cleric himself could be found preaching to audiences throughout the United States on the idealized values of a time and a place he called Old America. And I know at least one of you had a book with you. If you open up to the title page, you'll see that his publishing house was Old American Inc. Old America Inc. was his own um, publishing company. Wallace Nutting's Old America, a deft combination of myth and materialism, served as a kind of organizing narrative, an organizing myth for the minister's interconnected series of historically-minded endeavors. An evocative combination, melange of invented traditions, Old America provided the entrepreneurial minister, the entrepreneurial cleric, with a tap into the growing consumer culture of the early 20th century. Part halcyon sermon and part corporate facade, Old America provided the forum for Wallace Nutting, the minister, to become, in block print, Wallace Nutting, the trademark. Nutting's rise to national prominence is an unlikely narrative um, and very Horatio Alger-like, um, and one that the minister put to great use because he was really marketing his own personality um, and, um, and really sort of creating, inventing this, this sort of um, persona in the early 20th century. He was born on the very eve of the Civil War um, and left fatherless by the conflict, like so many were. His father died during the war. And Nutting shuttled between relatives in New England and the Midwest. Um, and I love the fact that when Nutting wrote his biography, his autobiography, and then and all the sort of corporate um, documents, he always made the point that he was born in Rock Bottom, Massachusetts. He was, you know, he had a wonderful sense, an ad man's kind of sense of how you spin a narrative. Um, but he spent his teenage years, wait for it, in industry, Maine. So he went from rock bottom to industry to Harvard and on into, into life. In 1876, he attended the Philadelphia Centennial where large scale displays of national pride in the form of nostalgic tableau like the New England Kitchen and exhibitions of revolutionary relics, the fuller cradle that once rocked on the Mayflower, John Alden's desk, George Washington's tent, and field equipment, they all were on display in 1876 in Philadelphia, and they all elicited widespread popular comment um, in popular magazines of the day. After clerking for a spell in a Boston emporium or, or department store, um, Nutting managed to attend Exeter, Harvard, and the Hartford and Union Theological Seminaries in training for the Congregational Church. Heading off to a life of service in the ministry um, in cities such as Minneapolis, Newark, and Seattle, Nutting soon, and these were really you know, modern cities, industrial cities, Nutting soon developed neurasthenia, really the bane of the Victorian thinking classes. And in an era before um, you know, Freudian language about our, our kind of sense of internal mental well-being, 
neurasthenia or the nerves was, was a very, very popular diagnosis in the 1890s through, the, through World War I or so. Um, it's, it's kind of a you know, form of anxiety, um, which was uh, extremely um, you know, common, particularly um, amongst women. It was sort of a feminized um, disease. So someone like a minister um, or an office worker, someone who isn't working with their hands, is probably more likely susceptible to um, getting the nerves than, than somebody who is actually doing something with their, with their hands in this time period. Agitated to the point of exhaustion, um, the minister turned to his hobbies in search of therapeutic relaxation. Nutting and his wife, Mariette, toured the mountains and the coast. And this is very common to try to get out of the city and go to northern New England, um, go to the you know, coast of Maine to breathe the, breathe the fresh air. They joined the throngs who took up the safety bicycle as a way of taking in the countryside. Nutting became a dedicated amateur photographer working in the pictorial mode, and this was that sort of soft focus mode that was really the um, hallmark of amateur photography um, just after the turn of the century. Um, a few decades later, um, serious photographers would deride this aesthetic, um, calling them fuzzy graphs. Um, so if, if you were, you know, um, oh, um, you know, a chemist or a pharmacist or an architect or someone who had some technical training, you took up photography in the last years of the 19th century, early years of the 20th century, um, and you produced images very much like this. I guess we should include congregational ministers in that list. Um, images such as House on Harvard's Hill that you see here are typical of Nutting's early efforts. Nothing worked to soothe his nerves, however, and Nutting soon stepped down from the pulpit of the Union Congregational Church in Providence, Rhode Island in 1904, and seeking peace and quiet, they moved to New York City, um, where they lasted exactly one year. After a year in Manhattan, living a studio on 23rd Street while trying to turn this avocation of photography into an artistic career, Nutting, sicker than ever, um, fled the city and became an acolyte of the country life movement. He moved up um, the rail line to Southbury and produced, uh, excuse me, purchased a derelict farm. I think you might recognize that house um, right here. Um, he went on to restore the house and he called it Nuttingham. Um, I'm very fond, there was a book by a woman named Kate Sanborn from about 1908, um, and it's all about how you move to Connecticut and adopt an old farm. Um, and there's this one line in it where she says, this is for everyone who makes the move from Gotham to Gooseville. Um, and so that's exactly what, what Wallace Nutting did. This is, of course, several decades before Mr. Blandings build his, builds his dream house, but you, you all sort of get the, the, the impetus of this time period. Nutting restored the structure and made a go of becoming a gentleman farmer here in Southbury, purchasing livestock and constructing an elaborate cattle barn just over the hill from the main house. We get a sense of what farm, what kind of farm, the Nuttings kept by reading a passage again from that 1936 autobiography. The cattle we selected for the beauty of black and white banding. The horses we bought for their handsome heads. The sheep and lambs because we loved them. If an animal would not pose for a picture, it was not for us. Uh, <clears throat> this agrarian dilettantism, dilettantism gave way to economic necessity, however, and Nutting turned to photography as his principal means of support. Farming was not going to make it um, in the early years of the 20th century in this part of Connecticut. He published ever larger catalogs of these platinum prints, and that was the, the genre of photography that he was working in. In 1906, in 1908, in 1912, by 1912, consumer demand was so great that the catalog reached 97 pages in length with dozens of different images on the page and contained approximately 900 negatives or images with extensive commentary in that catalog. To meet demand, Nutting hired uh, a group of young women from the surrounding countryside and converting Nuttingham, the house, and that barn um, that he built, the new barn, into a compound, really, that approximated the arts and crafts communes that were then springing up around um, the United States, like East Aurora, New York, the Roy Crofters, or Rose Valley, Pennsylvania, or New Clairvaux, Massachusetts, with another one. So there were these communities that were uh, attempting to kind of create a craft economy, if you will, in the modern era for a handful of people. Um, so Nutting was very aware of that endeavor, um, of that initiative, 
but he had slightly different ideas about how this would work. And he wrote of the change from trying to keep animals to um, uh, having this sort of enlarged photo studio in, in the barn. When my picture venture grew, we moved out from the house, cleaned the cement basement floor where the farm animals had been kept, and furnished, finished the barn above into two stories, the first for workrooms, the second for dormitories for the girls from a distance who colored the pictures. With a chaperone and a cook, we had under one roof, dormitory, studio offices, and in the basement, storage. Nutting organized his barn studio after the vertical assembly lines favored by early automobile manufacturers, and he was very aware. Nutting, Wallace Nutting, by the way, liked automobiles a lot. Moving black and white prints past the colorist station and on to the framing department. So platinum prints, for those of you who may be familiar with photography or any of us who ever took photography in school where you have an enlarger and then developer, fix, stop, and fix, platinum prints don't use the, um, the enlarger. Basically, you just have multiple um, negatives. You expose the platinum paper to the sun outside, very simple, and then you run them through the chemical baths. It's actually a fairly simple process. And then he would move these, and you see they're printed out multiple negatives to a sheet of paper, move them through the colorist stations where these young women had master guides for you know red, 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 blue, 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 green, 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 and they colored them all with the colors sequentially at a time. A number of us were talking about signatures earlier. If you, If we were to line up 20 Wallace Nutting prints of the same negative, we would probably see several different signatures um, because the head colorist was often the person actually signing um, Wallace Nutting's name to the, uh, to the photograph. And that role of head colorist was very important. Here you see the method by which Nutting printed out multiple images at a time, and these Nuttings, as they were shorthanded, could be had in a number of different sizes from small two by three inches to 20 by 30, drop shipped from Southbury from that barn. Now, amped up production reaped immediate profits. By 1914, um, Nutting's operation had outgrown that converted cow barn, and the minister and his colorists relocated to Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, Framingham was very central, um, wonderful transportation uh, infrastructure um, for, his, for his growing business. And it was from Framingham that Nutting uh, issued his largest catalog in 1915, which he called the Expansible Edition. And I love that made up word, Expansible. Um, it has a kind of a sense of where he's, where he's headed with his vision. Employing a very clever, flexible binding and an open system of stock numbers uh, and very no regard for like pagination. Don't try to go through an Expansible Edition sequentially. Um, Nutting could add to the catalog at any time without the expense of reprinting that volume. So rather than we all used to get the Sears catalog every year, what Nutting did is he sent one of these binders off to a print shop or a department store and then they could interleave in the new photographs, the new prints, into the, into the binding. So it was a very clever and kind of flexible way of doing business. It also showed what a Yankee he was because he didn't go to the expense of reprinting the catalog every year. Um, by the time of the expansible catalog, Nutting was selling these prints, these platinum prints, hand over fist. He claimed at one point to be doing $1,000 of business a week. Um, this is an era when a doctor or lawyer might make seven or $8,000 a year. Um, Nutting offered an image to fit every aesthetic in the catalog, in the expansible edition, a picture to fit every budget. There were views of abbeys and cathedrals from England, mountains and streams from northern New England, bridges and blossoms from Connecticut, winding roads and pastoral scenes. All in all, there were 19 different categories of domestic art photograph in the expansive edition. They sold for between $1.25 and $20, and again, think of you know, middle class salary, seven, eight thousand dollars a year. So this was, you know, this was significant if you're spending $20 on something depending on the size and the frame option. And again, Nutting was very clever about offering you different options for the frames. Um, when was the last time anyone bought a car? And you, know, you get to that final moment and they offer you the leather upholstery for just a little bit more at the, the end. So. By way of comparison, works by Wall uh, Willard Metcalf, the American Impressionist um, seen here, such as the Captain Lord House of 1920, could command several thousand dollars. So there again, if you just think about where these, where these images fit in the, 
kind of economic life of the middle class in the early 20th century, you'll, you'll get a sense of it. You know, the nutting um, that looks very much like Metcalf, $20, $5,000, so it gives you a sense of how, how um, affordable they are. Here's where it gets interesting. Approximately 20% of that 1915 catalog was dedicated to one category, what Wallace Nutting called colonials. These costume tableaus became Nutting's bread and butter throughout the teens and well into the 1920s and 1930s. Although Nutting exposed thousands of different colonials, Two themes organize the whole rubric. You can divide them all into two categories. And remember, this is the 1920s. So in a world of new women, of women who are going to college, of women who are um, suffragettes, who have just won the right to vote, um, who are flappers um, in the 1920s, um, who are increasingly taking roles in the public sphere, Nutting's female models were invariably posed in two extremely conservative modes. They are the genteel and the productive. They are either doing something or they are just sitting there as decorations. <laughs> they are good wives, so they're spinning, um, like Longfellow's Priscilla in the courtship of Miles Standish, so back to Longfellow again, and Whittier's mother in Snowbound, um, the spinning kind of paces the, the poem. Or they are 18th century ladies of leisure, objects in the interior, themselves not unlike the chest, the chair, the stand, or the looking glass. They are archetypes of traditional female behavior, and it comes as no surprise that Wallace and the colonials were often given as wedding gifts in the 1920s. So you may, as a woman in the 1920s, want to be working out of the home. You may want to go to college. You may want to become a typist in a, in a tall office building in Manhattan. But when you get married, you would be given one of these very, very traditional images to hang on the wall. So think about the, the kind of the, the message in that. Nutting, um, and here again, we can get in a little deeper. Um, Nutting intended these colonials, these images, to be prescriptive. And again, remember, this is a, a you know, minister who's very, very concerned about uh, the state of the country in this time period. As one kind of vision within the culture of the early 20th century, Nutting's views of women served as the delivery system for the Boston school painters into mass culture. Um, so here again, I want to just offer that kind of comparison between a nutting photograph and an easel painting. Um, this is uh, Edmund Tarbell's New England Interior. It's at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and again, it shows these young women, and there's a lot of conversation about this painting, if they are actually the, the daughters of the household or their servants. But what they are doing is they are sitting with all of their ancestral objects in the household and paying very, very close attention to these sort of lessons from the past. So like these more rarefied expressions of these painters, Tarbell, Frank Benson, Joseph Camp, De, De Camp, the minister's interiors, Wallace Nutting's interiors, are rife, are filled with these symbolic objects that really celebrate this kind of sense of quiescence in the female sphere. Unlike the passive props employed by painters, though, and again, only one person can ever own this painting, um, Nutting found a way to sell these images over and over and over again, and he found a way to animate these objects. And authenticity is really the key word to where we're going from here in Wallace Nutting's empire. Concerned that his colonials taken in private homes, if he was invited into someone's house to, uh, to stage a photo shoot, he was concerned that they lacked veracity or authenticity. Um, so Nutting sought out institutional partners, and this was the early historic preservation movement, um, the, the era of the early historic preservation movement. So Nutting exposed a series of images um, in the Cooper Frost Austin House in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and this was the first or second, I've forgotten, acquisition by the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, which has since become Historic New England, but was really the organization that um, led popular understanding of why we save old houses in New England in this time period. After much correspondence about the possibility of a joint venture with the society, um, the minister's relationship with the, the, the head of the society, a fellow named William Sumner Appleton, soured. Um, Appleton didn't like the fact that Nutting was making money on something that um, SPNEA was beginning to um, sort of define as what we would recognize as a nonprofit. 
um, sort of way of doing business today. So they went in very, very different directions. In a textbook case of vertical expansion, so think, you know, again, business, business school here, to say nothing of downright petulance, Wallace Nutting moved to assemble his own collection of house museums. So rather than figure out how to work with William Sumner Appleton, Nutting just goes and buys five buildings and restores them himself. And he calls them the Wallace Nutting chain of colonial picture houses. <laughs> the chain of houses comprised five buildings in three New England states purchased by the minister between 1916, excuse me, 1914, and 1916. And with the chain, Wallace Nutting organized an automobile tour of 17th and 18th century architecture um, by including structures such as the Joseph Webb House in Wethersfield, Connecticut, the Wentworth Gardner House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the Hazen Garrison House in Haverhill, Massachusetts, the Cutler Bartlett House in New Report, Massachusetts, and the Iron Masters House in Saugus, Massachusetts. And I already foreshadowed a little bit um, that Wallace Nutting liked cars. He, he himself was driving a Stevens Durier touring car um, manufactured um, not that far from here, I think it's Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, I think he spent over $3,000 on that car when he bought it in 1915. And at one point, and again, forgive me, this was 30 years ago, I did the, the sort of comparison. That's like driving an S-Class Mercedes. So Wallace Nutting, who liked to kind of put himself out as this old Yankee minister back to reconnect you with the values of the past, was driving a very flashy car um, when he moved from one house to the other and one of his uh, enterprises to the next. And he, he very self-consciously um, knew that the automobile was the future. So whereas painters often would um, take the train up from New York City to a particular spot in Connecticut, get off the train station, walk a half a mile and paint something, get back on the train, go back to New York City. Nutting had this understanding that people were going to be moving around by car um, in the uh, early 20th century. So again, very, very forward looking in this time period. Nutting undertook extensive and very creative restoration at each of these properties. Um, and this is somewhat typified. Um, this is the Hazen Garrison. Um, up in Haverhill, Massachusetts, somewhat typified by his activities at the Iron Master's house uh, in Saugus, Massachusetts. Um, Nutting employed a fellow named Henry Charles Dean, Harry Dean, um, and this is one of these uh, moments we've all just, um, you know, lived through a pandemic ourselves, which I think most of us never thought we would, um, but Henry Charles Dean was well on his way uh, to being a very, very famous architect. He was born in... Uh, um, um, the very late 19th century, um, but he dies in 1919 in the influenza um, pandemic. Um, so really the only uh, sort of work we have um, is his correspondence back and forth um, with Wallace Nutting, which is in the archives at SPNEA, about his work at um, the buildings such as this, um, the Iron Master's House. So Harry Dean, as he was known, was one of these figures. We, know, we don't know what, where Harry Dean would have um, moved on, who he would have become. He was one of three architects who were principally responsible for restoring buildings in New England before, let's say, 1920. Um, Joseph Everett Chandler from Boston, J. Franklin uh, Kelly, who was down um, in Connecticut, and then Harry Dean, again, in Massachusetts. Um, when I say creative restoration, so this is what Wallace Nutting purchased, the Iron Master's house. This is what Harry Dean turned it into. So this was a few years after Joseph Everett Chandler's restoration of the House of the Seven Gables in Salem, uh, Massachusetts. And restoration should be in quotation marks, I think, in this case. But you'll see, um, you know, there's very little <coughs> recognition, or we would have trouble finding the house, I think, if we knew it in one day. And this is actually photographed by Harry Dean, Henry Charles Dean, of the work in progress as they were peeling back later, um, later um, uh, changes to the um, to the building. Um, his drawings are extant, um, and you'll see that they had this very kind of medieval sensibility of what a 17th century house um, should like, with leaded glass windows and, and the, the many sort of dramatic gables in the front of the um, front of the building. The um, Webb House, now the Webb Dean Stevens Museum in Wethersfield, Connecticut, was basically the the portal. The, to this auto tour of New England. So if you were driving up from New York to go visit all these houses in New England, this was, would be your first. Not only did each link in the chain of colonial houses serve 
as a backdrop for nutting photographs. And again, remember, he bought them and restored them so he would have an authentic interior um, to shoot in. But each played a very specific role in the growing consumer empire of old America, of Wallace Nutting's business. The Cutler Bartlett House served as an exhibition space for platinotypes. So here you see actually the prints on display in the Cutler Bartlett House in Newburyport. And the Saugus property evolved into a fascinating comment uh, uh, um, on sort of, uh, you know, American history writ large. He turns it into a, a you know, factory space, if you will. The um, buildings are all self-referential, so they all kind of refer to each other. Excuse me, I don't want to give you whiplash going backwards, but this is that, the Webb House in uh, Weathersfield. Connecticut, and then he, he adds these very fanciful wall murals. If anyone's been to the Webb House, you've seen these murals. They uncovered them a few years ago. And you'll notice that he actually paints one of his other houses, the Hazen Garrison, into the Webb House. So there's something for the tour guide to sort of lead you to the next link in the chain when you visit each one of them. So it's all very integrated and all very um, um, sort of synchronized, if you will, for the time period. Um, Nutting in Saugus, so just north of Boston, established a forge, a second photography studio, and a furniture factory. Um, so this whole idea of that compound again that he started in um, Framingham, uh, he uh, amps up even further. Uh, and he christened that Ironmaster's house that we saw being restored by Harry Dean. He christened the property with, again, one of these great names, Broadhearth. He has this, this way, again, of branding. Remember Nuttingham, his next house was Nutting Home. Now we're at Broadhearth. The smithy, or the blacksmith shop at Broadhearth, provided an active stage for the performance of traditional craftsmanship. So he brought over a blacksmith from England um, who actually would work um, at, the, um, at, the, at the shop while you were there visiting. The photography studio exponentially increased his production a capability. He has Framingham and now Saugus. But the real story in Saugus um, is the furniture factory that Wallace Nutting established in the old Scott woolen mill right next door to the Ironmaster's house. And you can imagine if you've been to Saugus, you know by the time Nutting purchased the property, it was more or less an industrial neighborhood. So there was a factory right next door that he was able to purchase. Having gathered a sizable collection of furniture, and domestic accessories to use as props in his colonials in those photographs and to decorate the chain of houses, to curate the chain of houses. Nutting then prototypes the furniture by making full-scale photographs of them. So he literally full one-to-one -one size photographs which he then gridded off um, and measured drawings and he went into the reproduction furniture business. In an early manifesto of integrated marketing, Wallace Nutting wrote when he started this business, quote, those who know the pictures want the chairs. So he completely understood that if you begin to offer these experiences, you can buy the photograph, you can visit the photograph, you can buy the furniture that's in the photograph. And again, integration is the key word. Time and time again, Wallace Nutting employed a very, very sophisticated pattern of marketing and then production in his business lines. In 1917, he authored a guidebook to American Windsor furniture, one of the very first specialty texts um, on the subject. And then a year later, he issues this catalog offering dozens of Windsor chairs in a number of historic styles. So again, 1917, he writes a history book on Windsor chairs. 1918, excuse me, 1917, no, 1918, he offers you the catalog where you can buy them. So you can buy the reproductions. All along, tourists could visit the originals in the chain of houses for a 25 cent admission fee. In this way, Nutting organized a market, created demand, and then filled orders. Nutting sold these tangible history lessons for the home using the most up-to-date methods. He issued mail order catalogs from Saugus and Framingham, Framingham and Saugus, when he consolidated his business um, back there in the 1920s. He made widespread use of department stores as arbiters of taste and purveyors of home furnishings throughout the country. Here we see the display window of a store in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, but it could just as easily have been the Brandeis store in Omaha, Nebraska, or G. Fox in Hartford, Connecticut, or John Wanamaker's in New York City. Note the marketing efforts, the cross-marketing. There are these placards sitting on his chairs that say platinotypes are the jewels of the home and they're sitting on the Wallace Nutting chairs. 
There's a wonderful body of um, records uh, that I found when I was uh, working on the book, and it was it showed about a three-day visit, a Wallace Nutting visit to Baltimore, and you, it really kind of shows how how he um, uh, went about his business. So he he takes the train from Connecticut to Baltimore. Um, I guess by that point he was living in Framingham. He takes the train from Massachusetts to Baltimore. Uh, Saturday they have a party opening up his furniture line at the department store. Sunday he's the guest minister at a congregational church. Um, Sunday night he was um, invited to the mayor's house in Baltimore. Monday he's back on the train to Framingham. So when, when he shows up it's this kind of full, you know, Wallace Nutting didn't just come to open his furniture line, he basically took the city of Baltimore um, when, when he arrived. Nutting advertised widely in this time period. A scrapbook of his print ads survives, um, the kind of the, the, with the little tear sheets. Um, and it's not hard, the little uh, tear sheets of the ads that the agency, um, uh, as they would uh, place them in magazines. And it's not hard to see the irony um, that the George Batten Company of Madison Avenue um, held the Wallace Nutting account in the 1920s. And many of you may recognize Batten as the first B in Batten, Barton, Durstein, and Osborne, BBDNO, which was the largest advertising agency in America, I think, for most of the 20th century. Um, so this ad, offering beauty, construction, and style, ran in Antiques magazine repeatedly in the 1920s. And Nutting was also a very frequent contributor to Antiques magazine and other shelter magazines. Um, and he played a very, very important role in organizing the Americana movement as we understand it in the 1920s. If you were to page through Antiques Magazine um, from its you know, first years on, uh, Nutting was very clever. If he had an article where he was presenting himself as a scholar of American furniture on Windsor chair or oak furniture, 17th century furniture, um, if he had a big article in Antiques Magazine, he would buy a little ad. If he didn't have an article, he bought the full page ad. So he, uh, he wanted his name in Antiques Magazine um, you know, in a big splashy way, and he was going to have it one way or another, either through earned um, uh, sort of reportage as a, a scholar or through advertising. Throughout this period of rapid economic growth, Nutting expanded his conglomerate. His catalogs outgrew the Pilgrim Century aesthetic, um, represented by the Parmenter Sudbury cupboard you see here, the 17th century court cupboard, um, and began to encompass 18th century forms as well such as this copy of a mahogany chest, um, block front chest. This is in the, um, the original is in the copy, excuse me, the original um, is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And I think it's very telling that Nutting had access to these early collections like the American Wing um, at the Met. So the fact that he sort of has reputation enough to be able to go copy furniture from a museum in this time period really shows kind of his stature in the field. His access to these collections not only sort of signifies uh, his rising stature, um, but also his role as an author. In 1921, Nutting published The Furniture of the Pilgrim Century, and in 1924, he entered into an agreement with J.P. Morgan, Jr., um, that saw his collection, so his original furniture that he owned, um, transferred to the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford. Nutting published his magnum opus, The Furniture Treasury, in 1928. Um, and uh, a curator years ago at the MFA um, reminded me that, that that book was in print from 1928 until the 1990s. Um, so it had an extraordinary um, publication run. Nutting's stature and pocketbook increased um, not only with his publication of these furniture books, but also the state's beautiful series of travel books in the 1920s and in the second edition in the 1930s. And these are a catch-all of reused text from the minister's late 19th century sermons and recycled photographs from the teens. So there again, remember that image in Wallace Nutting's um, house in Newburyport where he has you know, his, his platinotypes on the wall of his historic interior that you can come visit or that department store in Pennsylvania where he has all these different, so Wallace Nutting if he was ever going to invest a dime in something, he was going to see that he made money back three or four different ways. Um, there were a few of his business records that were extant when I was doing um, my work. 
And I think most of us have, have kept a ledger at some, of some sort in our lives. You know, you kind of throw your expenses on one side and your profits on the other, and you hope there's something left down at the bottom right. Um, Nutting had this very interesting, like, accordion way of keeping his um, finances, where he would put the expenses in the middle, and it was almost like he was looking for a, you know, a 360-degree profit out of any, anything he spent. It, uh, I, th I always thought that was a very telling um, sort of window into his psychology. Um, if you're going to spend a dollar here, make it three different ways. Um, the State's Beautiful Books not only kind of updated, you know, his sermons from the late 19th century and his, um, his photographs from the very early 20th century, they also updated an, an earlier rubric of travelogue, New England travelogue, that was so very popular at the turn of the century. They helped define New England... Um, and other worthy historic states like Pennsylvania, Mid-Atlantic states, and Virginia as venerable regions despite the hustle and bustle of modern life. Those states' beautiful books also concretized Nutting's image and reputation, and they made Old America what it was, which is to say a very, very close ancestor of the biography-based corporations that we're all so familiar with in the last 20, 30 years. Think of the chain of colonial picture houses as the precursor you know, not only to colonial, um, you know, Williamsburg, but also to Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. Um, think of this as kind of, you know, a marketing platform. Think of Nutting's Old America, this whole idea of, you know, uh, a sort of a, uh, you know, publishing house that also sells you furniture and experiences and goods. Think of Old America as the harbinger of Martha Stewart's brand of living. Um, so he, you know, he beat Martha by decades. Wallace Nutting's images, objects, and texts from these moralizing colonial photographs to 18th century furniture fed upon one another to create a seamless narrative of colonial forms that made a virtue of the past for the modern era. In this way, Nutting employed what was frankly a fantasy by the 1930s and 40s, a fantasy of old America, to sell an idealized version of American history to a nation fervently um, embracing a culture of consumption. This was the era we went to department stores. This was the era where we you know, began to sort of buy houses on credit and sort of live in the way that we were all very used to and our parents were used to. Not only did Nutting provide a natural, tasteful picture at very little expense, but he offered a set of organizing myths and historical fictions, if you will, that allowed the new middle class to literally consume and be consumed by their past. So what Wallace Nutting did was he created the operating system for the American dream that comes after World War II. So all of the kind of values that are encoded in the explosion of suburbia after World War II all has its kind of background in the images of Wallace Nutting, the furniture of Wallace Nutting, the experiences that he was selling in the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s. So this is the way that Wallace Nutting picks up all of that historicism of the schoolhouse poets of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow at the mid-19th century and carries it forward into the modern era. Um, so if any of you grew up in a little Cape Cod-style house, like I did, um, it has a lot to do um, with the ideology of Wallace Nutting from right here in Southbury, Connecticut. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.